that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him may have eternal life. That's really at the heart and center of the Word of God for us and the Eucharist that we gather here for. It's about eternal life. Now we began in the book of Exodus and we, we hear that uh, the people were asked to live the Ten Commandments, to not have any strange gods before them, to not take the name of the Lord God in vain, to keep holy the Sabbath, to honor their father and mother, to thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not uh, steal, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not bear false witness, do not cover thy neighbor's wife or goods. All of that is really meant to be the basis of us living as Christian people. That's the beginning. That's not the end. That's the beginning. That's where we are to begin in our relationship with God. But it is a footnote for us that if we let fly a bad word, it's against the beginning. It's the beginning of the beginning. Even if it's by accident or whatever it may be. Footnoting for you, I was uh, uh, a seminarian, young seminarian, uh, actually a high school student, playing tennis. And my vocation director was on the court next to me. And I was missing a, quite a number of shots. And I would let fly a profound word. You can imagine what it was. <laughs> and so I missed a particular shot, got to the net, and he had missed a particular shot and got to the net. And he simply whispered to me and he said, does the language go with the game? From then on, from then on, there was a shift. And the shift was that I would usually, when I got frustrated, build a sandwich. And so, tomatoes, mayonnaise, on rye bread, with ham and cheese. Well, everybody on the court knew that I was partially nuts, but also they knew what was going on. That I had made a shift to try to give good examples. So we heard in St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians that it's about Christ crucified that we are Christians. No matter what our walk of life, no matter who we are, it's about Christ crucified. That's why we have a cross in every church. That's why we try to have a cross in every one of our buildings too. Because when we get into the gospel and we hear about Jesus with a rope or ropes if you will and going through the temple clearing it literally and you can imagine all the animals running out of the temple you can imagine all the money flying all over the place and they look at him and say what sign are you going to give us what sign are you going to give us to justify what you just did and he says to them in three days, I will rebuild this temple. Now, of course, they were thinking of the temple they were in. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. To rise from the dead. Now, why is that important for us? First, we really don't want Jesus going through our house of faith with that kind of accord, do we? I mean, I know I don't. Uh, and it's really more about us embracing the Paschal mystery in the midst of this. And the Paschal mystery is embracing the life of Jesus in our lives. The passion and death of Jesus in our lives. And yes, those are moments of suffering. And that's where the cross comes in. And then it's embracing Jesus risen from the dead and ascending to heaven. That's really what this is all about. But it does mean we need to face our faults. 
We need to face our weaknesses. We need to face our sins. Now, I don't know about you, but there's occasion when I have some football plays, when I was about this tall, that I still remember. And they're right here. You know, I miss the pass or I fumble the ball or whatever. Every now and then that happens. And Jesus is not there to condemn us. He's there to forgive us. That's what this is about. But we have to face what's going on in our lives first. So somebody pulls in front of us in a car, what are we going to do? No, the universal sign is not what we're going to do. Okay? And also an expletive, expletive, expletive is not what we're called to do. It's really a bit to be for us a moment of conversion. A moment of conversion. And letting him really reach into our lives and bring about the kind of change and conversion that needs to happen. You know what your weaknesses are. I know what my weaknesses are. He knows what they are. He's not pointing the finger at us. He's saying simply, come, let me embrace you with my love. Let me embrace you with my forgiveness. Let me embrace you with my pardon. For that is why I died on the cross for you and for me. And it's why I rose from the dead to say that nothing in this life can overcome us. Nothing in this life can overcome us. I'll say it again. And I can tell you as bishop, there's enough stuff that hits my desk and I go, Lord, I'm going down on my knees again because I know this is the one I got to put in your hands because this one's impossible. Impossible. And that may be something that happens to you in your life, but you see, to you and to me, I love you. I loved you enough to die on the cross for you. And in dying on the cross for you, I invite you into life eternal. For God the Father so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him might not perish, but might have eternal life. That's what we do at this altar. Pray for that grace in your life. Pray for that grace in the life of the church. And pray for that grace in the life of the world. That's an amen. amen.